Before we start, let me set the scene. A bit back, I was contacted out of the blue by a duo of mangaka who asked me if I wouldn't mind taking a look at their indie manga. Fans of train footage, bad audio, and terrible dad jokes, I'm guessing. I was surprised. They were a pair of Yanks. Yeah, a pair of Americans doing a manga. That's genuinely cool. And so, naturally, I immediately agreed. Actually, quite flattered. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? I gave them blood, blood, gallons of the stuff. I gave them all that I could give, and it has never been enough. I gave them blood, blood, blood. I'm the kind of human wreckage that you love. Hello all, this is the Owl, and today, oh boy, do I have something different for you. But before that, <coughs> oh man, you know, it's difficult to explain just how much this means for myself and Mrs. Owl. We are slowly but surely gaining traction, and on top of that, a handful of people who've continued to support us on Patreon even now with the economy in the crapper. I swear, you're all just fantastic. And I wish I had some way of rewarding you. Maybe one day. But today is not that day. Today is more of a punishment, as this, this thing, may be both the weirdest and the darkest piece of literature I'll ever cover on this channel. And no, that is not me issuing a challenge. Horror really is such an interesting genre. There's something for everyone. No, I don't plan on doing one of those silly iceberg videos, but it'll never not be a great analogy. See, within horror, you've got maybe four layers. On the top, you've got your mainstream PG and PG-13 boogity-boo movies like The Conjuring and Insidious, mostly designed for bored teenagers to have fun getting jump-scared to, and to maybe get their dates to snuggle in a bit closer. Culturally downstream from that, you've got your R-rated movies like Saw and Hostel, gory, sometimes squicky, but still mainstream and disturbingly popular. Further on downstream, you start getting to your NC-17 video nasties and splatter films, cult phenomena like Dead Alive, Last House on the Left, and similar. Stuff you probably won't see in cinemas, and it's more than most audiences want to see, but it still has its fans. And then, far down, near the bottom, you get to the really weird, really dark stuff. A genre often called extreme, or sometimes new extremity, and these movies range from art house to grindhouse. And some good examples would be stuff like Antichrist, Guinea Pig, Cannibal Holocaust, and of course a Serbian film. <laughs> These tend to depict an uneasy, at times nauseating mix of horrific gore, squick, weird sex stuff, or, yeah, more weird sex stuff, and are less designed to frighten than to horrify. This occurs within other media too. Comics and manga, for instance. You've got stuff ranging from Preacher and I Am A Hero, down to things like early Hellblazer and Magical Girl Sight, and then all the way culturally downstream to extremity content like Crossed, Tomboy, and Mei-chan's Daily Life. In manga, 
These are sometimes referred to as guro or gore, but I'll continue with the extreme tag to avoid potential confusion. This weird ass genre even has its own tropes. The films and the comics tend to be surreal, nightmarish, bordering on abstract at times, and are generally allegorical, sometimes to the point of being pretentious. They tend to lack a standard narrative structure and often feel experimental in nature. These are not designed for your enjoyment. If media further up the iceberg is punk rock, then this stuff is early black metal. It doesn't so much sing as scream. This isn't fun scary. This is stuff designed to leave you feeling confused, sick, and hollow. And that brings me to today's topic. Yeah, I am aware that little intro is quite rambly. That was, frankly, unavoidable. I mean, where the hell do you even start with something like Vitiators? Well, I guess you start at the beginning. As I mentioned, about a month ago, I was contacted by one of the authors, and he asked if I wouldn't mind doing a deep dive video on their comic, Vitiators. I agreed, not knowing quite what I was in for. Written by Eltron Frass, with art by Charles N., two American creators on the indie side of things. Vitiators is an extreme, or what the hell would you even call this? A western manga. Hmm. A wanga? Yeah, let's go with wanga. It's just fun to say. Wanga wanga wanga. Seriously, try it out. We're going to need all the silly humor we can find to get us through this one, folks. A few last things before we dive into this mass grave filled with tits and slaughterhouse runoff. Firstly, I am putting up a huge content warning right now. This is one sick puppy of a comic. While I am going to be censoring what I can and excluding what I can't, which I shit you not is most of the manga, this is a psychedelic nightmare in black and white, unlike anything I have ever come across. Yes, it's darker than that, and that, and even that. Yeah, okay, that's still pretty dark. The creators, I think, set out to create the grossest, bloodiest, sickest, and, well, most extreme thing they could, and on that, oh boy, did they succeed. Secondly, I'm going to be going through this as I always do. I am not going to dig around too much into symbolism, except where it's very interesting or very relevant. I will also admit, going into this, that this sort of comic isn't really my thing. Regardless, today, we're going to take a closer look at Vitiators, whether we want to or not, and see if we can't reach some sort of decision on it. Is it transgressive and profound, or edgy and pretentious? Is this incisive genre meta-satire, or the ravings of a drunk outside of a local bar at 2am? Is it more the boys, or just happy tree friends? Let's take a look, and... How would you put it, Pinhead? We have such sights to show you. Actually, no. Wrong. Because I frankly can't. Not kidding here, I can show you maybe a quarter of this wanger. I mean, the cover alone would get my channel newt from orbit, and that is mild compared to what lies ahead. Okay, breathe in, breathe out. Let's do this. We open with a bit of prose over some sort of Lovecraftian abomination floating in space and then we immediately cut over to what I think is supposed to be a fan gathering, discussing their favorite manga, Depraver. Right off the bat, I'll point out something that I like 
and something that I don't. The art in this is really, really good. The dialogue and text though, ugh. This is a very wordy wanger. Too wordy for its own good in fact. And the fact that the font is always the same leads to dialogue sequences that are rather monotonous. And that's where the dialogue is even somewhat comprehensible, because this story frequently devolves into a stream of consciousness ramble that feels like something Warren Ellis would write when he was on really bad acid. Although, again, this may all be intended. The fan's dialogue is deliberately stilted and pretentious, but we can tell already that these are pretty damn nasty pieces of work. Their favourite mangaka has been slow releasing chapters, and the final volume of Depraver left them all disappointed, but they think they could do better. We then switch over to the mangaka in question, a man covered in severe burns, and if he looks familiar, that is intentional. See, he's supposed to be Kentaro Mira, meaning that Depraver is likely an analogy for Berserk. This is a subtext that meanders in and out of the story, before becoming straight up supertext towards the end. But okay, some background for those who aren't in the know. Kentaro Mira, creator of Berserk, that incredible, ultra-dark and ultra-influential manga that sold so many foreign readers on the medium, reigned absolutely supreme over the see, this stuff isn't just for kids seinen genre, for years before Berserk began to have problems. Frequent hiatuses, some uneven art, and a general shift in tone to something a bit more stereotypically dark fantasy. And this turned Berserk from something universally acclaimed into something a bit more divisive. Amongst Western audiences, rumours swirled around Mira. Was he suffering from mental health issues? Was he depressed? Was he sick? Was he just burning out? The continued berserk hiatuses and what some perceived as a general decline in narrative quality continued, culminating in an anticlimactic final volume before Mura himself passed away in 2021. While his death was met with a lot of tributes, sadness and an outpouring of grief, a certain somewhat entitled sub-demographic of his western fandom were straight up outraged that Berserk would never get the ending they felt it deserved, which I guess means the ending they thought they deserved. And some even talked about continuing the series themselves, before eventually his creative team and childhood friend took up the reins to mixed reception. In interviews with the creators of Vitiators, this appears to sort of be the point of this wanger, an allegory of the sometimes toxic relationship between fans and writer, especially when that writer is, for whatever reason, either unable to live up to quality expectations or simply cannot continue the series. And yes, I know fans of Robert Jordan are pointing and screaming right now, but okay, let's see where this goes. This story, yeah, I hesitate to use that word, is divided loosely into interconnected chapters with their own little title. The first being Depraver. Is this the original manga? Is this the reauthored manga? Or is this the real world we are seeing? I have no idea. Right off the bat, this is where I realized that I was so out of my depth that the fish have lights on, and that this wanga was going to be a challenge. Here we go. We see that city hall is attacked by a roving band of cosplayers. Okay, 
like this was the freaking purge. And this massacre causes something to happen, resulting in the city turning into, I guess, the city from Transmetropolitan, called New Gehenna. I guess Gamora was a bit too on the nose. And the planet being enveloped in, yeah, again, guessing, a gigantic pseudo-fluidic layer of voyeuristic evil spirits called the Cryptorchosphere. Yeah, there are large portions of this story that are ridiculously abstract to the point of incomprehensibility. Again, the goal here isn't so much a coherent narrative. It's to rattle, unsettle, nauseate, and upset the reader, leaving them floundering, not able to find anything to hold on to. This is a difficult line to walk, as you risk falling into college film style social allegories, but to its credit, Vitiators generally manages to get this right. For the next while, we follow a nameless transgender character wandering the apocalyptic streets and it's ugh, basically just an avalanche of nasty sex and gore. That if I were to show you some of these pages, they would just be walls of black sensor bars. So yeah, we're skipping quite a bit here. I will say that, again, this is not my thing. I don't necessarily mind extreme content, but I don't seek it out. And it does worry me slightly that I know somewhere in the world, someone is pulling the pickle to this comic right now. Anyway. This character ends up buying a hit of a drug called Castrazia, Russian for castration, which again gives me massive Warren Ellis flashbacks in a big way. Fortunately, this drug does my job for me and senses all the cocks. There is a great deal of dangling dong in this comic, and by the time you reach the end, you'll be wishing that it was just normal genitalia. So I am guessing that the analogy here is pretty on the nose. The world sucks, and people use narcotics to cut themselves off from it as a temporary sort of suicide, but they don't want to go the full distance. That's bleak. Anyway, next segment. We open on a bustling street where I think that's two of the pretentious fans from earlier, one called Pontius Prell, and they're meeting with a guy called, you guessed it, Frogface. They want to see his living exhibit. We see that the neighborhood has been, uh, degentrified and turned into something of an anarchic urban wasteland. The graffiti on the wall makes me wonder if this was inspired by the ill-fated Chaz experiment, but I'm hesitant to try to connect anything in this comic to real-world events, lest I scroty mac boogerballs myself. We continue through his exhibits, which, yeah, surprise, surprise, I can't show you. Lots more weird sex and gore, although, again, pretty mild to the insanity that comes in the latter third of this manga. Prell isn't impressed though, and does a thing? No, I have no bloody idea. And we also get the implication that this dude is trying to replace Sun Kegel, and that he has near omnipotence in this post-crypto-whatever-sphere world. Is he supposed to be walking around in his own reauthored fan continuation of Depraver? Is that what's going on? Nope, no bloody idea. We get some more abstract stuff, showing us uh, a gimp, a ball of, I think, cereal, and a table somewhere else with a similar bowl and a gigantic dildo on it. Prell puts his wanger into the bowl, and 
something happens. We later find out that this is some sort of pseudospace, a barrier layer between realities that I think is implied to represent the imagination. Or perhaps it's the Jungian collective unconscious, I have no bloody idea. Is it possible for an entire manga to be high on something? Next up, well, how would you put it, Gideon? Hold on tight. The ride might get a little bloody. Oh, yeah. We start off in, yeah, a pretty well drawn series of panels, showing us something that looks like a cross between an orphanage and a prison. The orphans are being told a story by a very Junji Ito looking character called Orphan Maker Annie, the story, not the character. And I'll guess that this probably isn't a reference to that weird ass Marvel villain. We then get uh, a story within a story within a story as we see what I'm guessing is supposed to be a parody of a suburban family except that the wife is tied to the ceiling in full shibari, and the daughter, Annie, is tied to the bed. The incestuous patriarch of the family, George, informs them that he's hired a procurer called Exentera, which I'm guessing is a reference to the term Exenteration, which essentially means the surgical removal of organs. We see that the procurer injects something into him, referred to as lurid extract, which causes him to mutate into, okay, you know, I will admit the designs of the creatures in this manga are bloody amazing, almost worth the price of admission alone. They're almost certainly a reference to the frequently hypersexually symbolic apostles from Berserk, except that these are actually called depravers. Okay, a bit on the nose, but I'll take it. After he gives his wife a dose, he, oh my goodness me, I can't show you any of this, eats her out and then, well, attempts to eat her, taking a huge bloody bite out of her, shall we say, no-no bits. This wanger man. But she transforms into... Yeah, again, my apologies, but there are not enough sensor bars in the world for this sequence. How would I even describe this? Hardcore sex with a partially eviscerated vagina dentata monster with huge eyes under its boobers. And they continue doing the nasty until she, it, rips him apart. Holy crap, my eyeballs. Annie, the daughter, watches all of this and then yurks up what we are told is her soul, which then turns into a Digimon and attacks the Depraver, slicing it to bits with razor-sharp wings, but it then rejects Annie and fades, causing her to start to rot Orochimaru style. The decaying Annie returns to her parents' room and starts drawing weird shit on the walls in their blood. No, I'm not even going to hazard a guess at the symbolism here. Moving on. And after that, I think we could all do with a break. Go stretch your legs, get a drink, because from here on out, things get kind of insane. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby, let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Okay, we are back. Everyone sufficiently chilled out. Let's finish this thing. Still with Annie, who is now mostly skeletal which I'm guessing symbolizes something. We see that all of the adults in the apartment have become depravers, and Annie's soul Digimon is killing them. 
Oh, Orphan Maker. Yeah, I get it. We continue to follow Annie as she observes that the soul has orphaned the children and is leading them to another building, which I suspect is the orphanage from earlier. She pursues it, but is captured by a random dude who takes her to someone called the Beautician. Let me guess, more torture, gore, and weird sex stuff. Well, actually, that's a great design. It reminds me quite a lot of early Todd McFarlane before he turned into a massive douche cannon mixed with a ton of Junji Ito. We see that, oh, she just cuts a guy's head in half. Why does this feel tame all of a sudden? Oh, of course, it's because this is my third read-through of this frigging thing. And yeah, it is in comparison. The other dude leads Annie to the sofa, and she finds, okay, oh, it's that couch we saw earlier, but it's candy, not cereal. And this contains the Depraver book we saw earlier. Wait, what's going on in this manga again? Because I am even more lost now, as the manga within the manga within the manga seems to contain an accurate representation of the events in the world. This is sort of, kind of explained later. Utterly absorbed, Annie thinks she has found a way to lure her soul back to her, and she visits a local quadruple amputee who she proceeds to seduce and then in an I'll grudgingly admit pretty damn well drawn sequence of panels that makes me want to woof my cookies, rips off and eats his face and his eyeballs, oh, hoping that the soul will mistake her for a depraver and return to her, which does appear to work, but this freaks the soul out so much that it just nopes out and leaves the planet, heading out into the crypto blah blah blah, where its wings are eaten by cosmic abominations. Okay, next up. Nope, 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 nope. Next one. Okay, so in the last bit that, yeah, nope. We met a serial killer and rapist, lovely, who turns out to be Exentera, the procurer from earlier. You know, the one that turns people into depravers. She's basically a Joker analog and just wants to cause pain, sow chaos and inflict misery by basically turning everyone into depravers. Wait, let me read that. Are you saying that you invented Twitter? Because that kind of checks out. Regardless, the entire last maybe quarter of this comic is borderline unreadable. Oh, it's there, and the art remains pretty stellar. It's just so gross, so sexual, and at times so incomprehensible that I can neither show you much of it at all or even try to explain it because this shit's bananas, yo. Okay, let's try. Exentera forms a gang of more procurers who wander the city killing people in nasty ass ways, kind of like Pinhead in that terrible Hellraiser sequel. They eventually find an honestly the best I can do is Gun Cyborg Factory, which is likely a sledgehammer subtle poke at the firearms industry, but who knows, and they proceed to infect the cyborgs with lurid extract which creates even crazier biomechanical depravers, which are then set loose, as the original procurer gleefully dashes off. This is followed by another almost deliberately pointless aside, this time in the form of an action scene, where Exentera fends off the cyber depravers with a huge scythe, winding up badly hurt, until Prell, the reauthor, shows up again and erases the depravers. And believe it or not, 
this is where the comic hits maximum weirdness. Nope, I'm totally lost. What are we doing here, Manga? Cool designs, though. We get some more awfully annoying alliteration and deliberately pretentious pontification from Prell before the procurer pulls out a pistol and pops him one. He does something. More gross sex stuff happens. It rains lurid extract and suddenly the city is drowning in even cooler looking depravis. We get a bit of dialogue which I'm guessing shows the reauthor realizing that the story is getting out of his control now. Really now? Not like the fifth page of this sodding wanger. But we're now in full on allegory mode as a pretty funky looking depraver who is implied to be son Kegor attacks Prell and beats the stuffing out of him while harshly critiquing his work. We get, ugh, surprise surprise, more gore and more weird sex stuff, including a prehensile spine going up someone's butt pipe and Prell gets ripped apart. Wonderful. The creature in turn is attacked by Exentera but rips off her head and finds the orphan maker's soul, now wingless, coiled around her spine. Nope, not asking questions, the end is in sight now. And we snap back to San Kegor in reality? Seriously, what even is reality anymore? He's in a trance, but okay, the figure that we saw creeping up on him earlier in the manga is watching him from the closet. We then cut back to Orphan Maker in the, I'm guessing the manga world, who is dragged back into the orphanage by a bunch of tentacles. All the orphans are now dead, nope, can't show much of that, and the tentacles are actually the original Annie's ribs, which I'm sure symbolizes something again. But I'm sort of beyond trying to puzzle this wanker out. We'll talk a bit about the symbolism and allegory at the end. I promise. Somehow, Annie does seem to succeed in reabsorbing and reintegrating her mutilated soul, and leaves out into the Kryptononsense world, which is now overrun by the Super Depravers, I think, and in a sequence of panels that are almost certainly a direct reference to that scene from Berserk, she loses her arm to a pretty kick-ass monster. Yeah, this one? This one right here? I think that's the boss. <laughs> the manga then turns back into a blur of weird mutant genitalia and gore for a while, where Annie is saved by, oh joy, a guy called Pissmaster. What are we doing? Who likes to piddle on people? She summons Orphan Maker who, yeah, that's pretty cool. And after some more pointlessness, she cuts a hole into the story itself and what annie emerges into an abstract land the i'm guessing imagination realm you know the place with the gimp and the bowl and it's all quite thoroughly trashed we get some more frankly impenetrable allegory which ends with annie shouting down the bowl cursing the writer son Kegel. Our final scene shows San Kegor's corpse, now almost completely immolated. Oh, he literally burned out. That's actually almost clever. And the figure we saw stalking him a few times thus far turns out to be this Fuan Nortane looking bastard, who's come for, I'm guessing, the unreleased manuscript of the conclusion of the original manga. And yeah, 
This is where the Miura allegory becomes pretty overt, and finally we get what I think is a fairly clear explanation of some of the symbolism. Let's take a look and see if we can follow along. Okay, the ending of the manga contained within the manuscript, as it so happens, was not amazing. It was going to be a letdown, and if you think about it, that's actually both smart and rather sad. See, that's the thing about Berserk. It was, in a sense, lightning in a bottle, something that had a momentum and inertia of its own. Its ridiculous popularity gave it an existence bigger than itself, and the ending that fans imagined, well, let's be honest here, nothing that Miura could possibly write would have come close to satisfying that anticipation. Maybe it's better this way, that the story ended on such an anticlimax, and that the final confrontation between Guts and Griffith can be left to play out in our imaginations, however we'd like it. But, whilst being a struggling author, or a hem, content creator is tough, there are also a unique set of problems that occur when you create something really good and really popular. A stressor, a sense, that if you don't continue to pour everything you have, every second of your waking life into the project, and not only continuing a standard but finding ways to top it, you're letting down the fans, the story, and your characters. This may sound weird, but if you've ever written stuff, I am sure you can understand this to an extent. And this is why so many authors and mangaka end up burning out, or just straight up rushing through the last part of their story, as they come to feel trapped by it. While I hesitate to make any definitive claims about Vitiators, I think that's where the story actually ends up. Which, huh, you know, for this blizzard of giblets, monster boobs, and horrible Gygadex, that's a remarkably astute observation. There's a bit more weirdness, but let's end it there, because I need to go and shower, bleach my eyeballs, and then probably spend 10 years as a celibate vegan in a monastery somewhere. That wasn't a comic, so much as an ordeal. It feels like someone's taken a gigantic crap inside my brain. Someone that ate something quite hallucinogenic. So, did I like Vitiators? Well, no. No, I didn't. But, I don't think that's the point of this story. This isn't a product that is made to be liked. This is something created by people who evidently wanted to get something off their chests. A primal scream of rage directed outwards towards some parts of the online western fandom of Berserk, and, by extension, similar fandoms of other media. It's sick, twisted, warped, gross, bloody impossible to follow at times, and utterly furious. But, in that, there's a certain black nail charm to the whole thing, an earnestness and a passion to go the whole damn way. A project that feels like something you'd get if you put Junji Ito, Inio Asano, Kazuo Umezu, and Derek Robertson into a blender, and then added a lot of cheap peyote and a pig carcass. If you're curious, you can check out the entire thing at Expat Press. Just be warned, know what you're getting into, and probably don't leave this lying around where anyone could find it. So, phew, that's me for the day. Thanks for watching. Don't worry, we'll be back to Maiden Abyss quite soon. Until then, take care my friends. If you want to help myself and Mrs. Owl out, and buy me some extra eye bleach, you could always head over to our Patreon. If you want to come and chit chat, shoot the shit, give feedback, make suggestions, or even post art, you could come over to our Discord, it's actually pretty damn fun. Anyway, cheers, this is The Owl, signing off.